Okay, welcome everybody. So today's presentation is going to be about the Guardian of the Constitution uh, as a result of a debate between uh, Hans Kelsen and uh, Carl Schmidt uh, regarding uh, this matter. Uh, as always, we're going to try to uh, present the plan, the work plan that we're going to follow during this presentation. Now, uh, as is the, the habit, we usually try to uh, define first the concept that we have. We need to understand what is the Guardian of the Constitution, what is the judicial review, in order to actually understand the whole thing. But then th th there seems to be a problem here because uh, the definition of a Guardian of the Constitution or even if adjudication happens to be at the core of uh, this debate because the two sides do not even uh, agree on that. Which means if we try to advance this uh, or that definition would be taken side. So we're going to try to leave that until the, the end, until we discuss the uh, two arguments uh, from the uh, two authors. So what we're going to start with instead is actually the, the factual background, uh, the circumstances uh, during which this debate actually uh, arose. Now, uh, as we see, it did exist before, but then uh, there were some incidents that actually uh, brought this back to light. In the third step, we're going to try to advance Kelsen's views on uh, this idea of a guardian of the Constitution, since uh, the first one to write about that was probably uh, Kelsen, I mean, except if we uh, leave uh, aside the American context. Then there was uh, then in, a, in step four we have Schmidt's views, and here it was sort of a response to to Kelsen, although. It did not address Kelsen directly. On the contrary, we're going to see Kelsen's rebuttal to what uh, Schmidt said. And here, uh, it was actually addressed to, to Schmidt uh, directly in name. He, he uses his name in reply. Uh, now, finally, we're going to try to, to draw some uh, conclusions on uh, this matter and try to see uh, how all of this reflects in uh, today's situation. The first thing that we need to do is to actually realize the layout at that uh, point. We're basically talking about the 1920s, uh, 20s, 30s, and here uh, we don't have much models when it comes to this idea of a guardian of the constitution. Now, of course, we have the American model, which is uh, the uh, first system to adopt such a review uh, in 1803, following this super famous case, Marbury versus uh, Madison. Now, we should note that this power was not mentioned in the Constitution at all, that it was self-proclaimed, as in uh, it was the Supreme Court which actually decided that, hey, I am the uh, guardian of the Constitution, I'll be deciding what is constitutional and what is not. And it should also be noted that this idea was still contested until way later, until during the Civil War. Um, Lincoln was one of the fearsome adversaries of this idea, and he thought that he could interpret the Constitution as much as the Supreme Court can do that. Uh, now, we also have the Austrian model, uh, which is it created a constitutional court, a different distinct body, not part of the judicial one, not like the American uh, model. This is uh, included in the uh, Austrian Constitution of 1920, and in fact, it is very similar to what Kelsen has theorized, since he was one of the uh, writers or uh, of the, the Austrian constitution. Then we have the German case. Now, when it comes to the German case, we do have a new constitution in 1918, and it, it created so many new things. For instance, it has an elected head of state which is uh, something new in continental Europe. And it also has a, some sort of a court of justice. And it's not really a, a constitutional court, and it's not the normal uh, adjudicative uh, court either. And now it's trying to figure out where it, it actually stands in all of this. And it is here that uh, our uh, problems start, or that the debate is initiated, since it is the result of, first, we have uh, the fact that the president uh, issued an emergency uh, decree. The chancellor of uh, Germany or the Weimar Republic actually used that decree in order to depose the government of uh, Prussia uh, based on two arguments, uh, the threat to public order and safety and also that Prussia actually violated its duties towards the Reich, towards the uh, government, the Weimar Republic. And this led Prussia to actually go to the Court of Justice for the matters of state. This is the court that's trying to 
decide which way to go, as we said. And finally, the court has decided that Russia did not violate uh, its obligations towards the right, but it nevertheless said that it cannot interfere with what the president did because it is uh, uh, trying to achieve public order uh, and public safety. It, it is here that actually the debate uh, starts, as uh, we said, but we need to, to take a few points into consideration before we uh, follow. We have to uh, know that that there were some uh, uh, threats to public order and safety in reality, which is what led to the emergency uh, decree, especially in Russia. We have also to realize that the uh, parliament, which is elected uh, proportionally uh, in uh, Germany, had been unable to form a majority, and thus it could not form a parliamentary government, which means that the government that we have right now is basically one that, that, that is chosen by the president. And so all of this debate is going to be uh, during this exceptional circumstances. And it is definitely going to affect the uh, views of uh, both sides, but especially Schmidt. Now, as far as the decision of the Court of Justice on the matter of state goes, uh, Kelsen, of course, thought it was uh, too weak in a sense that the court actually decided that what the president did was wrong, which means it was unconstitutional, but he failed to invalidate the, uh, the decree. It, it couldn't take uh, further steps, which it should. And here, Kelsen does not blame the court, but he actually blames uh, the uh, constitution of the Weimar Republic, which did not emphasize the authority that the court had, like the Austrian example, for instance. Schmidt, on the other hand, uh, thought that the court did not have such a power in the first place and that it could not actually review uh, a decree and could not, that that was not within its uh, authority. Now this very practical issue is actually the result of some very deep theoretical uh, problems and it is he here that our own problems start. because we're going to get very theoretical. And uh, now we're going to try to present Kelsen's vision in order to understand why is he saying uh, this, or why is his opinion about the uh, what the court did uh, is that, is so. And of course, we're going to go as well to Schmidt and try to understand why is he saying all that. Now, I suppose by now we're familiar with uh, Kelsen's theory of uh, hierarchy when it comes to, to, to law. We have the constitution uh, in uh, the top of the pyramid, then we have statutes, emergency decrees as well, since we're speaking about exceptional cases right now, and then we have regulations, usually it's just regulations, but now we're going to add judicial decisions for a, 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 a reason here. But now we're going to try to look at it in a, in a different way. Don't, because the, the, this hierarchy sort of supposes that one norm is higher or is stronger, which is a problem that Schmidt would actually uh, fall for, but th th that's not how it is. Let's just try to understand it as a succession of steps in the creation of law, which means that this rule allows this rule to be created and this rule allows that rule to be created. And starting with the constitution and ending even with uh, regulations and judicial decision, whether it's individual or uh, it's of general uh, nature. Here, the main claim for it uh, Kelsen is that all of these are legal acts, which means in nature they're really no different. The difference is only in the degree. Uh, this is very uh, important because it has uh, really some serious repercussions. Because uh, this is the way that constitutional review is possible for Kelsen. Since legislation is no different than uh, regulation, and it's basically enacted only through the uh, constitution, which means it, it is an execution of a uh, constitution, then it could be actually subjected to review. Exactly like uh, we have administrative courts who, who, uh, which actually uh, do uh, verify the legality in comparing to statutes because these are the execution of statutes. And so uh, all of these are legal acts and every legal act is both Norm enacting is legislative, and it's also executive uh, in a sense, even when it comes to uh, uh, legislation. And so here, it just depends on the level of creation versus execution that we have. It could be uh, a wide margin, 
uh, of this question, which ends up with so much room for creation and less for execution, and it could be actually the opposite. So much for execution, but then it's for uh, a little for creation, which is the case when it comes to judicial decisions or regulations. This here has some serious consequences on the idea of separation of powers, which Schmidt would use to say that we can't have judicial review because it would be inflicting uh, uh, on this uh, theory. It would also uh, uh, have results when it comes to the idea of sovereignty, because in this sense, since all are, are just legal acts, then uh, even the idea of sovereignty cannot be attributed to one uh, body because essentially it's no different than any other body. It's just uh, we're dividing it uh, to, to, to confirm that legality and not to because it's naturally different. Uh, this is actually how Kelsen arrived to his idea, his famous idea, that uh, law is the state. Because for him, these governmental fun functions or powers that we have are nothing but activities. And these activities are comprised only of legal acts. And so at the core of it, these legal acts are the result of uh, legislation and execution. So the government itself or the state itself would be nothing more than uh, legal acts. And that's why the state and law are the same thing. This is also used to say that Adjudication is no different than administration, and since it is so, then we cannot say that adjudication or the judge just executes the law. No, he does not. It's like we said, a combination of both creation and uh, execution. And so the uh, judge cannot only look at statutes, he's not bound only by statutes, but he has to look at the constitution as well. And at the same time, he's not just executing the law but he's actually enacting some sort of a norm, no matter how restricted that, that margin uh, would be. This argument is going to be used also to uh, defend uh, politicization, as we will see later. Now, because of all of this, Kelsen uh, then goes to presents his idea of who should be a guardian of the Constitution. Of course, he dismisses the parliament as, uh, and the government because uh, they already have uh, uh, functions and they can't actually... Uh, they're, they're positive uh, actors. They are making all these claims, and so they can't actually verify the actions that they did because they would already think that it is constitutional or legal in a sense. And so you'd need a neutral body. And for him, this should be a constitutional court. Now, of course, he explains everything, the scope of the court, the procedure, the object, what could be uh, reviewed or not, and the results. What should the... Uh, court decide uh, at the end. The goals for Kelsen basically is first legality and constitutionality as part of that. Uh, also it helps as a safeguard against uh, majority rule and one for federalism as well. Now as far as, I don't know if you <laughs> if you, you're keeping up with me, but uh, now we're going to go to uh, Schmidt's views which are basically uh, replies to Kelsen's theory. Now, when it comes to Schmidt, he does advance so many arguments as well, and these sorts of definitions are exactly like Kelsen because they do differ on a conceptual uh, framework before uh, they reach the uh, factual conclusions. Uh, for instance, the the definition of constitution of uh, education is completely uh, different. Because for Schmidt, it's just the strict application of law. It's something mathematical. It's scientific, <laughs> which is uh, uh, ironic since the scientific theory of law is uh, Kelsen's domain, while uh, Schmidt is more of a uh, historicist or politicist, uh, as we are, are going to see. Uh, there is the uh, something important for him as well is also the phases of the state. We need to realize that because it makes a huge difference for him. For instance, uh, now his conception uh, that in the 19th century we had uh, society, we had a parliament that represents that society versus the uh, monarchy. Uh, but right now it evolved into uh, one system, like the society and the state are the same thing. And by state here he means government because he's going to include the parliament, and this is why he would not accept it as the guardian of the constitution. And it's this, uh, this melting of the society and the government 
uh, is one he's going to use as actually a basis to choose the president to, to, to be the guardian of the constitution. Uh, he's a strict uh, believer in the separation of powers in the traditional sense of the term, as in we have three different, completely different functions, and each one has to remain its own in its own uh, sphere. And he sort of attacks this idea of hierarchy of norms and uh, says it's completely fictional. We cannot have weak norms and strong norms, and uh, this is just uh, an imagination. Uh, this is uh, it's based on all of these definitions that he's going to argue against a constitutional court. Uh, first, like I said, uh, adjudication is just the application of law, and constitutional uh, adjudication is not that because it will be. The, the constitution is vague and trying to interpret it will be, will be basically choosing between different interests and this is going to be purely uh, polit political. In this sense, uh, a constitutional court uh, or constitutional adjudication would not be uh, adjudication at all. It could not be a, a court. Uh, this is the first argument. The second one is that it can be adjudication also because it's going to be putting a, a, a norm against another norm. We have a statute which is a norm, and then we have a constitutional norm as well, and we're going to be fighting and then choosing one over uh, the other. So this uh, normative battle is basically for Schmidt. Uh, that's not the definition of, ex uh, ex if of adjudication, because adjudication is just subsuming a, a factual case under uh, a norm. And finally, a court would not be uh, uh, democratic. So uh, that's it. And of course, because he believes in the separation of powers, then for him, decisions are not statutes, and statutes are not regulations, and he, he makes that strict uh, uh, definition. Of course, Schmidt, uh, from the beginning, he tries to submit the American model. He says clearly that it, it is a unique model in the world, and it cannot be replicated. Uh, in a sense that it actually interpreted these vague concepts that we find in the Constitution, like poverty or freedom, or in an author uh, authoritarian way. And so basically you cannot just bring all of that and try to implement it in a completely different social and economic and historic uh, circumstances in continental Europe. Uh, he also speaks about the fact that there is no administrative state in the United States in the first place, uh, which is relevant to his idea of the state and uh, society becoming one, which apparently is not the case in the United States. Uh, like we said, uh, all of his definitions are going to be used to uh, disregard the parliament as a guardian of the constitution because he doesn't oppose the monarchy anymore in the presence of society. In fact, because of all the parties and uh, the division, he, he does not even represent the general will that he did in the 90th, uh, 19th century. He just represents the interests of uh, specific groups and in that sense it cannot be a guardian of the constitution, a constitution that represents the unity and identity of the German people as a whole before we get into politics. This is why, uh, at the end of it, uh, Schmidt presents the president uh, as that. Again, like we said, uh, the state is self-governed. The state and society is uh, the same thing, which means uh, that the president represents that uh, society. This would result, of course, in what he calls the caring state. The state is not only law, as Schmidt says, but it's also uh, law and culture. And in this sense, he presents the president as a pouvoir neutre, as, uh, and here this should be understood that he's above party politics, but not above politics. It's political function still, uh, and that's why he denies the, uh, the judges or the courts this uh, uh, power of reviewing the constitution. And finally, uh, there is all the functions that the constitution gives to the president, which allows him to actually like the emergency power, which allows him to safeguard the constitution, and he's voted for by the, all the German people, like I said, he presents the unity and the general will of the German people. Now, of course, Kelsen did not just take that uh, for granted, and he wrote an extensive rebuttal to everything that Schmidt says. He labeled all of uh, Schmidt's ideas as uh, monarchical, as uh, a pure uh, political ideology that would lead to despotism, which is what most people would say about uh, Schmidt. It's another attempt to empower the monarchy, which is uh, symbolized in the uh, head of state right now. Uh, he's also head of government, and he's uh, elected, which means he's subject, subject to uh, the majority, to the he has to answer to his majority if he wanted to be uh, re-elected again, and he's in the government, and he 
is not meeting both party politics. Uh, now, as far as the definitions that Schmidt gave uh, for uh, uh, Kelsen, adjudication is no different than regulation, is no different than uh, legislation. The clash is not really between norms, as Schmidt puts it, but instead it's between uh, a norm and the creation of a norm, which is a factual thing, and so constitutional adjudication is actually uh, adjudication. Uh, here, uh, Kelsen has to admit that all legal acts are political acts in the sense that they're not the exact execution of uh, law. And this is really uh, a surprising, perhaps, uh, thing that Kelsen uh, would say. Also, he stressed the fact that there is no strong and weak norm. As we explained before, we have to look at it as a succession of steps in creation of law uh, and not as one uh, weak versus strong uh, norm. Well, as far as the democratic uh, problem, Gilson dismisses them easily. He doesn't uh, elaborate that too much. He simply says that a court could be uh, elected, that the president is only chosen by a majority and not by the whole people. He does not represent uh, everybody. That the constitution is actually the result of the parliament. And so, <laughs> in a sense, it's not the will of the people. It's not the general will. It cannot be used as an argument in that sense. And finally, that pluralism is part of... Uh, this constitutional and democratic uh, uh, layout, and it cannot be criticized in that sense. No, Kelsen also dismisses the idea of a dual state because he cannot comprehend it if it does not include the uh, legislative. If it is to become a dual state, then it is to incorporate all aspects of uh, the state, including the legislative uh, society and the, the government, which is not the case. And finally, he clearly laughs at the idea of unity and general will as fiction and as a way to authoritarianism, which is a critique that also uh, was uh, uh, forward to uh, Rousseau's idea of general will. Uh, okay, we have taken so much time, so we can try to go this very fast. Really, uh, one needs to understand the context in which Smith is actually uh, fighting, because it's an exceptional circumstance, and for him, the president was the only one that could bring back the normality that uh, we're, we're seeking through the powers that the constitution gave to, to him and no other organ could actually do that. If a court declares his emergency decrees as unconstitutional, then it's just going to worsen the situation. Perhaps that's what happened in Germany. That's what he claims that it led to none. And if we had stronger uh, head of state, then uh, probably uh, Germany would not end uh, in Nazi Germany later on. Here, one needs to, uh, uh, I think we probably pointed that out during the, uh, by explaining the debate. One needs to, to differentiate between what the authors thought and what the, their, and how their followers actually uh, portrayed them. Uh, despite arguing for a scientific theory, Gelson uh, actually uh, admits that there is some sort of a political element in every legal uh, act, which is very uh, surprising perhaps. He's also not as much of a formalist. Uh, since he believed that the every legal act is both the execution and the enacting of a norm. And so he doesn't uh, take that to the letter. Schmidt's views at the core are actually democratic. Uh, that authoritarian result is in no way intended. It's no different than uh, results in rule, which could also lead to uh, the same uh, result. Now, as far as the implications today, I wanted just to, to, to point out, to get us back to the actual state after all of these theories. Uh, the way constitutional adjudication, for instance, from a point of view of the Algerian constitution, I believe that adjudication is understood according to Schmidt's view, because it's literally just the execution of the law, and in this sense, the constitution could not be applied by a uh, judge. Uh, the presence is also the guardian of the constitution in that sense. It, it falls from his idea, which means he's still influential in a sense, even if it is understood in a, a different way. Uh, the rest, though, is basically mirroring what Kelton said, that hierarchy of law, creation of constitutional courts, the way it is organized, what it should do, it all uh, it's all following the Kelsonian model, which is a, uh, perhaps a, a way more influential than any other model in this sense.